Let's just look towards the throne room and lift up our hands. And when that mountain wall melts, there is no need to fear. There is something so precious, so sweet to your faces on, got your hair combed, got dressed. You know, my brother-in-law is visiting from uh, Arizona, and uh, he said, is it okay if I wear my pajamas? And uh, I said, I don't care. He said, well, they're pretty ratty. I said, I don't care. I don't care what you have on, as long as you're here, right? So he did take a shower, and he put his old dirty pajamas back on. He came upstairs. I said, well, at least you showered. <laughs> but, but anyway, I like to tease, don't I? Let's stand for the sounding of the shofar. And thank you for watching and joining by Facebook and also on YouTube. You know, when I'm preparing a message, and we were talking to Greg earlier each week, and uh, he said, how do you get those messages? I said, I read a lot, I pray a lot, and then uh, I write a lot, and then I have to do a lot of editing because I can't preach everything that I studied. Uh, you wouldn't stay uh, if, if I did that. But, uh, but anyway... Um, we're going to be looking at Luke chapter 12 as we start um, chapter 12 and reading through the uh, 1 through 7. Um, just before we get started, I want to just make sort of an announcement. Um, the eclipse is tomorrow. Tra you know, and Tracy brought up something really interesting. You know, like I said, I don't know if the rapture happening tomorrow, okay? I'm not predicting that or anything, but... I tell you what, the signs are all there. <laughs> the signs are there. 
The Bible says in Matthew 24, there'll be earthquakes more frequently, more intense. And Tracy uh, said, you know, the earthquake in New Jersey this week was 4.8. Tomorrow is April the 8th, 4.8. I thought, oh, that's interesting. (laughs) And I don't know when the last time was that we had an earthquake in the United States, but he said after that, there was also uh, an earthquake out in California. So um, those things are going to become more frequent. They're going to become more intense. And we also had an earthquake um, in, was it, what was it, uh, Taiwan. Taiwan had an um, over 7.4 uh, earthquake. And so all these things that we're hearing about are the signs of the times. And that's what the Bible tells us is going to happen. Tomorrow will be the eclipse. I hope you'll be safe, and I hope you'll enjoy that. And uh, my brother-in-law, Gary, has uh, an additional seven pairs of uh, glasses that you should wear during the eclipse. And he wanted me to remind you that do not look at the sun until it is totally eclipsed. Because if you do, even a corner of it, the light can be bright enough to damage your eyesight. So we don't want anybody to be injured that way. We want you to be safe. Another interesting point before we get in the message is that uh, I was thinking about, you know, uh, it says that Jesus, when he comes back, will come back in the clouds. And so I was looking at the uh, forecast for tomorrow, and it said partly cloudy. So these could be signs. Revelation 1-7 says he's coming back in the clouds. So does Matthew 26, 64, and also Zechariah 12:10 said, when you see him, he's going to come with the clouds. So partly cloudy tomorrow. Look at those clouds, and uh, it may very well be tomorrow. I don't know, but uh, you better be ready just in case. Amen? You better be ready. You better be prayed up and ready to go. We all have um, uh, experienced fear, and before we get into the message of two types of fear, I want to pray and ask God's blessing. Thank you, Father, for the written word, and thank you, Lord, for the power of the Holy Spirit. We thank you, Lord, for already we have worshiped this morning in different ways. We have had an anointing of oil, and, a, and we, we believe in the healing is going to take place. And, and Lord, we, we just uh, praise you and thank you for all that. And Lord, we have been uh, able to give, and uh, that is a part of worship. And so, Lord, we just pray you'll uh, anoint the messenger this morning, not that it would be my words, but it would be through the inspired and illuminating of your word uh, through your messenger. We just pray and ask all this in Jesus' name, amen. Two types of fear. We all have experienced fear uh, at one, uh, one time in our life or another, and if you haven't experienced fear, you will at some point in time in your life. Uh, some types of fear is when you are afraid or when you are scared, and uh, being scared is a temporary state of fear. It's like when someone jumps out at you to scare you and your heart almost stops. And my uh, grandson Isaac loves to scare me. And I wish he would scare Beth instead of scaring me because I'll be sitting down at my desk. He'll come down the stairs real slow and stealth-like and he'll sneak up and he'll get just like a foot away from me and he'll go, yeah! Yeah! I don't want him to think that he's successful, so I act like it didn't scare me. But it has scared me every single time he's done that. Because I know if I react to that, he's going to continue to do it. But if he gets no results back, maybe he will stop. So I don't want to encourage him. But uh, but he he loves doing that. And I think I probably did um, when I was his age too. So being afraid... Uh, Being scared is temporary. It's almost an immediate uh, type of fear. Being afraid is a longer-lasting fear, and it's worrisome, worrisome. And then there's being terrified. Have you ever been terrified? Terrified expresses a stronger degree of fear, almost a paralyzing type fear, uh, such as when uh, the guards were at the tomb and uh, the angel appeared and the guards fell asleep. They were so terrified of the angelic presence of God that they uh, virtually passed out and were paralyzed uh, because of the fear that they were experiencing. They were unconscious, in an unconscious state. So how many times in the Bible have we read where the angel of the Lord appears and he says, do not be afraid or do not fear? 
he has to emphasize for you not to be afraid, not to be in fear, because if you just saw him, you would be terrified. And I think if an angel walked in here, and, it, and we could all tell that it, had, it was an angelic being, and he walked in here, I think all of us would experience that type of fear in our emotions and in our spirits. We would be afraid. Uh, and, and so they always would preface uh, that do not be afraid when they were appearing. Then there's... Um, uh, the Bible talks about the fear of the Lord, and fearing the Lord is used in the Bible, with, and it's different than being afraid. It's different than being scared. Um, this type of fear refers to a respect or reverence and trust. Afraid is used when you don't respect and you don't reverent and you don't trust the Lord. So the fear of the Lord can be a good thing, but it also can be a fearful thing uh, and I'll explain that here as we go on. The Bible speaks about the great and terrible day of the Lord. When that judgment day will come, there's going to be different types of fear. For instance, in the Bible, there were two types of fearing God, which is what I want you to get this morning. The good type of fear of God is to the fear of being without God. The fear of living in a world where there is no God. That would be fearful. And so the Greek word describes it uh, is this type of fear is uh, called phobos, which means reverence. So the fear of the Lord can be, that can be a good type of fear when we fear the Lord and think that we can't live without the Lord. We wouldn't want to live in a world and a society without that. So the other meaning of that Greek word, phobos, is fearing the power of God in judgment. And so we have those two types of fear, fearing God without him having, uh, uh, being in our, in our lives and in our world. And then we fear the power of God in judgment in the last day that we all will stand before him and give an account. So that type of fear, because his ability to judge sin righteously, strikes fear into mankind. And that type of fear gives us the understanding that sin... Uh, with sin, there is punishment. And the Greek word phobos is the same word in these two different types of fear, but you have to look at the context in which they're used to get the meaning and which one of those are. The Hebrew word is yar, which means to be in awe, which is the first type of fear of God, in recognition of his creative power from plant life to human creation, to look and to know that God, in his amazement and wonder and the awe of who he is. And when I was growing up, my parents instilled two types of fear in me. Can you, can you say amen to that? I, had a, I used to, I used to a dream about mom and dad dying when I was young. Did you ever, did you ever think about that? I used to think about mom and dad, if they die, what am I going to do? And I had this fear that mom and dad were going to die when I was a child. And I didn't know what would happen to me and where I would go. And I, I'd have nightmares about mom and dad being killed. And, and I, I just had this fear of being without them. Then I had the fear of their punishment. Uh, and, and they were disciplinarians, let me tell you, especially my mother. And so, so, yeah, she knows too. Uh, we, we've talked about that. Sometimes it was uh, over the top. But, but at any rate, we had a fear of her and her wrath that she could impose upon us if we did something wrong. So there's two di different types of fear. And in our society today, the general public, um, because of spineless people in our judicial system and in our governments, have lifted the state of fear from our minds and from our lives. And uh, that tells us, if, uh, tells us that people, if, if you do that, there'll be no punishment. If you break the law, there'll be no punishment. There were, and where there is no punishment and there's no consequences for your actions, when there is no judgment, the results of having no fear at all will br bring total chaos to society. So fear can be a good thing. When we fear the punishment, it keeps us kind of on the nar narrow way. Then we have people with no fear. They have no fear of punishment. They had no fear uh, in our society. And when you have that, society runs amok. 
and uh, crime against people and property will no longer sear the conscience. And when people have no conscience about right and wrong and they have no fear of punishment, then you can expect anything and everything, including murder or rape or whatever it is that goes on in our society, they have no conscience about what they're doing. And the more that they get away with it, the more they'll continue to do it until the fear of judgment is reinstated. When they understand that there's going to be punishment for their actions, that curbs their actions, and they will stop doing it. We see it all around us in our nation today, and until we restore order and restore the punishment, we will no longer live in a safe nation because we, as godly people, we understand what fear is. We understand what society expects out of us. So fear is not always a bad thing. Uh, a matter of fact, fear is a good thing. I think it keeps many of uh, people in our society in check, and they understand that there'll be consequences. But when mankind is controlled by evil, evil will dominate our society. Amen to that. Evil has no limits. Evil has no filters. And evil has no fear. And so we must understand where, where that, that bad type of fear and that controlling type of fear that keeps us on a straight and narrow comes from, it comes from Satan himself. A society without the fear of God uh, will bring all that chaos to our society. And I think we're, we're, we're living in that to some extent, but I think it can get much worse than what it is now. Therefore, we as believers in Christ must vote. Here's my, here's my political speech. We must vote to put responsible people in our government from the local level to the national level. And we need to look at these people and see if they have the fear of God in them. And we need to vote biblical principles, those that will stand for biblical principles and biblical values. We'll see in our text today in Luke 12, 1 through 7, Jesus is dealing with the subject of a type of fear that we all should have. In the previous chapters, in chapter 11, uh, is among the teachings uh, uh, where it is known as Jesus gives these hard sayings. And, and the hard saying, he would say, woe unto you, woe unto you if you do this, woe unto that. He's saying you should be fearing God's punishment if you're doing these certain things because there is going to be a judgment day. We need to know what the fear of God is in our lives as we walk. And this is a warning that few people heed today. And it's a few, it's, uh, a few people even care about it at all, what fear is in their life. They maybe not even think about it. But it is a warning that comes from the authority and the Almighty God. And I urge you to receive it as such. Not my words, but His words. So if you look at chapter 12, you see that it's almost a continuation of chapter 11. And, you know, uh, as I've said before, uh, back when they wrote the scriptures, they didn't divide it into chapters and verses. It was one continual thing. So you can kind of read through the book of Luke and, uh, Luke and not even uh, look at the chapter divisions and read uh, the entire scripture. But when Jesus was meeting with some religious leaders and, and he was speaking to the Pharisee who had invited him into his home to have lunch, it wasn't that the Pharisee liked Jesus, and it wasn't that he liked his teachings or agreed with his teachings. He, matter of fact, he did the opposite. It was, a, it was a time that maybe he could trap Jesus in his own words, so that Jesus would be saying something to discredit him or convict him. And uh, they have tried before this, and they tried after that. And later, through their own self-righteousness, they would find their own fault in him uh, to bring him to the cross. So Luke chapter 12, verse 1 says, In the meantime, when there was gathered together an innumerable multitude of people, insomuch that they trod upon one another, he began to say unto his disciples, first of all, Beware of the leaven of the Pharisees, which is hypocrisy. Beware is a warning from our Lord. If we look at the word beware, it means and emphasizes a warning sign. So beware of the leaven of the Pharisees, which is hypocrisy. The setting here is just outside of this Pharisee's house. 
and one who had invited Jesus to come in and have lunch. So when Jesus did not participate in the ceremonial washing of his hands before he ate, the Pharisees called, called him out on it for not doing so. But you've got to realize something. It wasn't <clears throat> that he didn't wash his hands before he ate as a matter of hygiene. It was a ceremonial washing to cleanse his hands before he ate. It wasn't about hygiene. It was about a ritual. And it wasn't even enough water. It was enough water that you could have put it in half of an eggshell. That's how much water. And the servant would come and the Pharisee would hold his hands up and they would uh, take this very small amount of water and pour on his fingers and he would hold it up and let it run down his hands and down and drip off his elbows. Then he was ceremonial, clean, cleansed uh, to eat at that time. So it wasn't about hygiene. There wasn't any soap involved. There wasn't enough water to do anything anyway. But when Jesus refused uh, to wash his hands before he ate, the Pharisee says, whoa, what are you doing? You're breaking this ritual. You're breaking this tradition. You should be washing your hands and becoming clean. So Jesus calls him out on this, and he confronts him, and, he, and, and basically what he's talking about is their self-righteousness and their ceremonial, ceremonial rituals, and he tells them that their outside might look really clean, but the inside is dirty. Your inside is unrighteous. You think you're righteous, but you're not. You've cleaned up, you've ironed your clothes, you have all the, 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 the outward appearance of being a holy man, and you're not holy at all. And so Jesus is calling him out. No wonder they, they were mad at him, right? But uh, Jesus pronounced judgment, and he uses the words woe in, in the book of Luke. Namely, he's pointing out their hypocrisy. Now, we'll get into what that means in just a minute. So after all this has happened, Jesus begins to address his own disciples first. And remember, there's an innumerable uh, multitude. We know multitude means a number you can't count, but he's also adding innumerable. We're talking about five, ten thousand 10,000 people probably that have followed him to this Pharisee's house because it was unusual anyway for a Pharisee to invite a Jew into his house. So he's like... Everybody, let's go see what Jesus is going to do. Let's go see what Jesus is going to say to this guy. And so they're all outside. And, you know, on their way to the Pharisee's house, they were pushing and shoving, and there were so many people that they began to, to stampede over each other just so they could get to the house so they could listen to Jesus. Now, I've been here at Asher Valley in nine years, uh, uh, about completed, and I don't remember people and in a number of uh, multitudes uh, standing outside the church and pushing and trampling over people to get in to hear what I have to say. Now, I would like to see that, but it hasn't happened yet. So anyway, they're outside, they're trampling over people, they're trying to shove, they're trying to get in, they're trying to get close so they can hear, and Jesus is using this event to give a warning to the disciples and an illustration that would have been very familiar to them at, in their day. He tells them to beware of the leaven of the Pharisees. Now, what does that mean? He's describing the leaven likened unto their hypocrisy. So what does that mean? It means that the leaven, like hypocrisy, it will begin with a little thing in your life, and then it will, be go, it will begin to grow, and to the point that it will permeate the whole person. So leaven is like yeast. Everybody knows what yeast is. And I've seen Beth make a, a homemade bread. She makes great homemade bread. And if anybody wants a homemade loaf, just tell Beth and she'll make you one. <laughs> but, you know, I've seen her put the bread dough there and she's, she puts the leaven in and she covers it with a, with a towel and lets it, begin to work inside that dough. And you ladies know about this. Us guys don't. Okay. So, but as, as that leaven begins to permeate the entire uh, dough ball, it begins to swell and rise, and it, uh, pretty soon it's permeated the whole uh, dough ball of bread. It started with just a little, and it spread and permeated through the whole dough ball, and then it began to rise up. And that's why Jesus is using this as an illustration that everybody used leaven in bed, uh, bread uh, 
baking. So the leaven is used in the Bible almost always to illustrate, and it always represents sin. Except in, I think in Matthew, it, it, it uh, talks about building the kingdom of heaven. Uh, that's the only place that is used in a different context. So that's why context is always important. But in the book of Exodus, chapter 12, verses 13 through 15, during the Passover celebration, the Jewish people were to remove any leaven from their house because that leaven represented sin. And before the Passover, they wanted to remove the sin and anything that represented it out of their home. So Jesus is warning that the teachings and the doctrine of the Pharisees will get inside of you and it will... Uh, will be like leaven begin to grow and he says they're teaching you something that is hypocrisy and before you know it it will take over what your thoughts your emotion your spiritual beliefs and and whatever you believe about god the hypocrisy that they were teaching and the doctrine they were teaching would begin to permeate the whole person and you would be under false teachings and also false burdens verse 2 there is nothing covered that shall be revealed, neither hid that shall be, uh, not be known. So when you put leaven uh, bread dough in the pan a little and you cover it, you think it's covered up, but it's not. It's working under the cover. Same thing when it's in our lives. You can cover it up. You can, you can let sin in into your life and you can let it permeate, and you can, you can ignore sin, and you can say, well, I don't need to ask forgiveness. It's something I want to do. Nobody else knows about it. And so that will permeate the whole person. And so Jesus is saying the hypocrisy may be hidden at first in a person's life. And, we, and you can hide it for a while. You know, you can hide your sin for a while. You can hide it from people. You can hide it from, you know, people close to you. And you can continue to do something in secret and in the quiet uh, of life. But pretty soon that hypocrisy is going to come out. And so there, uh, verse 3 it says, Therefore... Whatsoever you have spoken in darkness shall be heard in the light, and that which you have spoken in the ear in closets shall be proclaimed on the housetops. Now, what does that mean? Is it almost like a riddle? Whatever is said in secret will be revealed, and whatever is spoken in darkness will be, be revealed in light. He's talking about the judgment of God. He's talking about the great and terrible day of the Lord. He's talking about when you die and you stand before God, things that you hid in your life and you hid from everybody, that you cannot hide it from God. God knows every single thing about you. We'll get into that in just a second. Are you with me so far? Say amen. amen. LaVon, you falling asleep yet? Good. We've been praying for you. So verses 2 and 3, Jesus is really talking about the judgment of sin and that sin will be judged. You can't get away with sin. It's going to come out. It's going to rise to the surface. And he's talking about, uh, he said, if you believe me, you will have fear. And he's talking about that terrifying fear when you stand in judgment. I've heard many people say, I don't fear God. But you will fear God on judgment day when you stand before him. If you haven't known fear in your lifetime, you will know it in your afterlife. When you stand before the Almighty, who is the final judge of your destiny. He's saying, your sin is not hidden from God. Whatever it, it, it is, it has permeated your life. It will be revealed in the judgment of God. And so, like I said, you can hide it from men, but you can't hide it from God. You can live a life of hypocrisy, saying, and what that means is saying one thing and doing the opposite. Um... You can cry, be crying out that you're holy to other people. You can put on a facade. You can say, you know, I'm living a Christian life when you know you're not. That's hypocrisy. You may be looking for the praise of men, but what you really need is the approval of God. And you'll never get it when you're a hypocrite. Colossians 1.10 says in the ESV uh, translation, so as to walk in the manner worthy of the Lord, fully pleasing to Him, bearing fruit in every good work, and increasing in the knowledge of God. You are not pleasing God if you are ignoring His teachings. 
You can't live any and every way that you want and ignore what Jesus said is the way his followers would live. If you do not fear him in reverence, the reverence is that type of fear. You certainly are not pleasing him if you do not honor him, if you do not walk with him. You're walking in hypocrisy, and that will only bring the judgment of your sin. Hypocrisy is sin, but it's not a sin. Hypocrisy is a, is a term used for a lot of sin in your life. It's not just one sin, but it is, a, it is a multitude of sin that you have allowed to creep into your life and you're living a life of sin, but you're telling everybody else that you're Christian and you're holy. That's hypocrisy. 1 Thessalonians 4.1 uh, in the uh, King James Version says, Furthermore, then we beseech you, brethren, and exhort you by the Lord Jesus that you have received us how you ought to walk, how you ought to walk. Now, he's not talking about stride. He's talking about how you live, how you walk with the Lord, and to please God so you would abound more and more. So why is he saying you can get saved and you can be stuck and not live uh, for God? And you can do that. And your salvation, I believe you're going to go to heaven, but you're going to be judged on your works, on your walk, and on if you have received Jesus. There's going to be a judgment day. You think, well, I just live any way I want. No, the Bible doesn't say you can live any way you want. He's telling us here how you ought to walk and to please God so you will abound more and more. The more you walk with the Lord, the more you get close to him in relationship, the more you read the Bible, the more you know, and, and the more you know, the closer you get, and it all fits together in a pattern, but you ne must know how to walk with the Lord to please God. Luke 12, 4. And they say unto my friends, Be not afraid of them that kill the body, and after that they have no more they can do. The worst anybody in this world can do to you is to kill you. And guess what? You get to go to heaven if you know the Lord. I mean, is that, is that the worst they can do to you, is take your life? That's the worst. And it says they can't do any more than take your life. He's talking about you're going to be persecuted. You're going to be persecuted for your belief. You're going to be persecuted for your walk with the Lord. But he said, don't worry about it. The worst they can do is kill your life, and, and I'm going to take care of you. You're going to come and be with me. He's telling his disciples and those listening outside the Pharisee's house, and he's telling you and and, and and me today. You may suffer that persecution for the kingdom. And they may, you may even be killed for your faith. But don't be afraid to stand up for the truth. And I think the church is laying down. When we see things going on in society, we're afraid to stand up for the truth. We're afraid to say something. Because we're afraid if we say something and we call out sin for sin, that we are going to be persecuted. People won't like us. You know I spent 28 years with the state police. Nobody liked me. And I don't understand that. I was just passing out free paper and stuff like that. They go to court and get to give an offering to the court system and stuff like that. I don't understand why they didn't like me. But we can't be afraid to stand up for what's right. We can't be afraid to stand up for what truth is. We can't be afraid to walk the walk with Jesus and proclaim that Jesus is my Lord and my Savior and I'm walking with Him no matter what society says, no matter what they say about me, no matter how they persecute me, I'm going to stand with the Lord. Don't be afraid, or He says, don't fear them that can kill your body because your soul lives forever. Fear not what man can do unto me. I think it says over there in Hebrews. Notice he said, fear not them. But we look at what he says in the next verse, verse 5. But I forewarn you whom you shall fear. Fear him which after he hath killed hath power to cast you into hell. Yea, I say unto you, fear him. He's saying, fear God in judgment. And we have that good type of fear as 
we're in the awe of God, the amazement of who he is and what he can do. But he's saying, fear him that can cast you into hell. He, Jesus tells us not to fear them, but fear him. And a lot of people will disagree and say, we should never fear God. We better fear God in the right ways. And there's different types of fear and fearing him. He's talking about when he's casting someone into hell, he's talking about the spiritual death, the final judgment. Fear the one that has that authority to cast your soul into an everlasting hell. The trouble today is that people don't fear God at all. They probably don't even think about the judgment that is to come. And whether you believe it or not doesn't make it not true. You know, you, you tell somebody some, a truth about the Bible. I don't know if you've had this happen. I have. You tell them a the truth about the Bible, and they say, well, I don't believe that. They don't believe that because it brings conviction and it brings judgment upon them. And they really, if they really thought about it, they would understand that they're going to be held accountable. But they don't, I don't believe that. Whether you believe it or not is beyond the facts. The facts of the Bible are true. And if God says this is going to happen, it's going to happen. And there's nothing you can change about it. Whether you believe it or not, it's going to happen. Look at verse 6 and 7. Are not five sparrows sold for two farthings, and not one of them is forgotten before God? But even the very hairs of your head are numbered, which I always say he's good at subtraction. Fear not, therefore, ye are more valuable than many sparrows. So what's he trying to tell us? He's telling us that God knows Everything that goes on in the world. He knows when the sparrows are sold or are fallen from the sky. Back in that day, you could buy a sparrow for, two, for a couple of pennies. God knows that. He knew that. He knows that now. He knows when a bird falls from the sky. He knows that. He knows that. And then what he's trying to say is, I know everything about everything, and I know about you. I know everything about you, but I want you to know this. You are much more valuable than a sparrow. You're much more important to me than a sparrow. You're more precious to him than anything else. Back year, years ago when I was a very young evangelist, about the age of 18, I was holding a revival there uh, on the southwest side of Indianapolis, a youth revival, and, uh, and, and many Many came to know the Lord. Uh, a lot of young people came to know the Lord in that revival. I remember that. But what I do remember is I asked the deacons and the pastor if they would go out visiting with me in the, in, in the community around the church, and they all said no. I said, okay. So I went myself, by myself, as the evangelist, I guess the evangelist went out, and I went door to door, and I was knocking on the doors, inviting people to come to the revival, introducing myself. And, and so... Uh, I, the people I would ask, you know, are you going to church anywhere? And they would said no. And I said, well, we'd love to have you come for this revival. It's not still a church out here. And they said, I wouldn't go to that church. That that was the last church on this earth. And I was like, uh, why? He said, that church is filled with hypocrites. He said, I see them standing out there on Sunday morning. And this was true because I called them out during the revival. <laughs> They're standing out there. They're all, all smoking out in front of the church, and they go in and act like they're all holy and good and all that. And he goes, I'm just as good as any of them. And he says, I don't want to go to that, a church where there's just nothing but hypocrites in there. Well, I, I hate to tell him, if he found a perfect church and he walked in, it wouldn't be perfect any longer. But a hypocrite defined as a person who puts on a false appearance of virtue of religion. Hypocrisy is, like I said, it's not an individual sin. It's a lifestyle of sin. It's saying you believe what God says, but you're living a different way. Or if someone says that they have particular moral beliefs, uh, but behaves in a way that shows that they're not sincere in what they've said that they believe, then that's hypocrisy. Now, it would have been better for those people in that neighborhood if they would have said, well, that church is uh, filled with a bunch of sinners. That would be more correct. And that would have been probably a better thing for the people in that church to be known as sinners than as hypocrites. I'd rather be a sinner than a hypocrite. It's better to be a sinner. At least sinners know that they're sinners. 
And hypocrites think they're full of, they think they're righteous. They think they're doing okay because their sins are hidden and nobody sees them. But let me tell you something. People do see it. They do see your life. They do see your walk. They see your actions. And you're presenting, uh, you're presenting a life of walking of Christ just like the Pharisees did. They're walking in the law. They're keeping the law. But yet they're ignoring the truth. And they're preaching false doctrine. That's what hypocrites do. People who are hypocrites see themselves as righteous and they don't see their sin. But sinners see themselves as sinful and they know they need Jesus. So Jesus is saying, beware the Pharisees and comparing them to leaven because they could not see their sin. Just like in the people in that church. I remember what I said. I come in that evening after visiting in that neighborhood and... uh, uh, I got up to speak and I said, you know, how many of you believe Jesus is coming back in the clouds? And oh, amen, amen. I said, I pulled into the parking lot and uh, I thought Jesus had come back because there's this great big cloud in the parking lot. But I said, I fought my way through it. It was cigarette smoke. <laughs> they didn't like that and they wanted to end the revival that night. But we didn't. We went ahead a couple more nights. What Jesus is saying a little bit of hypocrisy when it enters into your life like a small sin that enters into your life but it cracks the door open to become a stronghold in your life and then you wonder why God's not blessing you you wonder why God's not using you that's when we really need to examine our lives so Jesus is saying if you allow a little bit of play acting into your life, playing that you're a Christian when you're really not, or pretending, or deceitfulness, or attitude of self-righteousness, and you have all those things in your life, you're not going to be able to control it. I had many people I dealt with as a trooper that were addicted to drugs. And many times I heard these comments from these people, I have it under control. I have it under control. Or, I know what I'm doing. No, they didn't. They didn't have it under control, and they didn't know what they were doing. Satan had a grip. And his, his greatest tool in his toolbox is deception. He will deceive you into believing a lie rather than a truth. When you live a life of hypocrisy, you can't see the truth. And it will fill you to the core and destroy your character, destroy your reputation, and put Christ in open shame. Jesus says, be careful of that. Be careful of living a deceitful life. And then he speaks of the consequences of that. He says, for there is nothing covered that will not be revealed, nor hidden that will not be known. Any attempt to hide ourselves in the world to maintain a facade of righteousness is not authentic. And at some point, it's going to be exposed. For nothing is covered that will not be revealed. Think back in the time of the Garden of Eden and the first sin that was committed. What was the very first thing Adam and Eve did? They hid themselves. They hid themselves from the presence of God. They tried to cover up their nakedness. They tried to hide their sin and and flee from the presence of God. But God knew all the time what they did. When we have sin and we try to hide it from everyone uh, because we don't want anybody to know, but God knows, and you can't hide from Him. In the judgment day, all attempts to conceal our sin will be useless. You can't make excuses before God when He knows everything because everything that is currently covered up will be revealed and there's nothing that is hidden that will not be made known in the judgment. Therefore, whatever we have spoken in darkness will be heard in the light and whatever you have spoken in the ear of private, uh, private to someone will be proclaimed from the rooftops. So what Jesus is referring to, he's referring to the day of judgment when you will stand before the Almighty God and give an account for every idle word that you speak. Matthew twelve thirty six. But I say unto you that every idle word that men shall speak, they shall give an account thereof in the judgment day. That's pretty simple, isn't it? You talk about something that will bring the fear of God. Think about every idle word you've ever spoken. 
So he might say, well, <clears throat> I'm saved, so I don't have to go through the judgment. And that's a deception. You don't have to go through the great white throne judgment, but you stand before the judgment seat of Christ. And the judgment seat of Christ, every idle word, every work, every, everything in your life will be judged and it will be revealed. It will be that darkness will come to light and it will be revealed before God, before the angels and for all men to see. And you will feel about this big when you realize that everything you thought was hidden is now being revealed before God, before the angels, and before all men that were there. So what you've done is secret. It's not really a secret forever. So you won't stand before the great white throne judgment, but you will stand before the judgment seat of Christ. So here's the thing. The Bible says, Romans 8.1, there is now for no condemnation to them which are in Christ. Many people that quote this verse stop right there. And, and I can agree with the words, but it also says, who walk not after the flesh, but after the Spirit. So he's telling us there is a way to walk in this life. There is a testimony that your life gives. He's saying that there will be a judgment for how you live, how you act, and what you say. Now, when we are standing there in judgment, and all of our things are revealed openly in a court, Jesus is going to step up, and he's going to say, I'm his lawyer, and I have forgiven him by my shed blood upon the cross. Now there's no more condemnation of those who walk with Christ and they're in Christ Jesus. But there will be a judgment for everyone. And I think that's misunderstood many times from the pulpits and from the Christian uh, community. All of the things that were hidden will be made clear. The truth of obedience, the truth about your sanctification, about our profession of faith, that will all be manifest before God on that judgment. Now listen, God's merciful. And, and you know, we, we stand in awe of who God is because he is, he is so powerful and so complicated. We can't understand everything about him at all. We walk by faith. But if God would reveal to us today all of our sins that we have ever committed all at once... I think we would kill over with a heart attack. Think about it. If he says, look, I'm going to tell you all the sins you've committed, every word you've said, and I'm going to tell you right now what it is. I think it would be so overwhelming, we couldn't stand it. So what he does, because he's love and his mercy, he reveals slowly, he reveals our sins to us on a daily basis. And he does that so we're not overwhelmed with our sinfulness. He does that to bring us back into, uh, he br so we can feel that conviction. It brings us to a repentant heart. So, and there's a reason for that. The Bible says, so he can conform us into the image of his son, Jesus. So it, living a Christian life and walking with God is a marathon. It's not a sprint. It's slowly revealing Christ in our lives and revealing our, our sin and confessing our sin. So there is a fear of all, and it's the fear, that one fear of being without Jesus in my life. I fear that. And then you have to be in fear of his judgmental power. And if we understand that, and we have to understand that, that God loves us, but yet he is just. God sent his only begotten son to offer him uh, as a sacrifice for a payment of our sins, for yours and for mine, so that we could obtain grace and mercy through, uh, through Jesus. And how much more he loves you and how much he cares for you and me. I do fear life without God, but I fear not knowing him. Because not knowing him condemns me 
to an eternity without him. Do you fear God? Do you fear him in the right ways? Do you fear a world without God? And do you fear a world with a God that is just that you're going to stand before when you pass from this life? That's a question, many questions you should ask yourself that was contained in this message. Many questions. You know, I stand up here and I preach every single week. And I just hope and pray that the Holy Spirit reaches out through His Word and permeates like leaven, kind of like leaven in the good way, and He permeates His Word into our lives and that that Word can begin to grow in us and bring us up in the admonition of the Lord. It can bring us up to walk worthy of the title Christian. Amen? Let's stand. Father, as we have presented your word that you have given to me this morning, I pray, Lord, that your word would not return unto you void, but, Lord, it would go out, and, Lord, it would permeate our lives. And, Lord, as a result, we will make changes in our life. We will make sure, first of all, that we know you as our Lord and Savior, and then we will make a, a, a dedication and a commitment to walk with you and to learn of you and to walk in your teachings and be the light and the salt in this world that it so desperately needs. Help us to have the fear of God in our lives in the good way and also in the just way. And I pray and ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Raise your hands and receive the blessing. May the Lord bless thee and keep thee. May the Lord make his face shine upon thee and be gracious unto thee. May the Lord lift up his countenance upon thee and give thee peace. Go in shalom peace. Amen.